Good afternoon, happy Savage Saturday, keepers of the cash, Gary B, the casual comic guy here. And today, guys, we're here to talk about character creation. And we're going to use Brissa today as an example. Uh, and this is just something to me that is so important when you're creating a character that you're going to put into a universe, an established universe. And a lot of people get it wrong. A lot of people don't take the time or a lot of people take the quick shortcuts to character creation. And I'm happy to say and I'm happy to report also since I'm a Conan fan that Brissa doesn't take any of those shortcuts. We're going to discuss what Jim Zub and team have done right with the character creation of Brissa, something that other creators, other teams, uh, other companies could take to heart and help create lasting, interesting characters within their universes. So we have an established universe with Conan the Barbarian. All right, just a, a fantastic universe, a universe that goes back into the early 30s and created by Robert E. Howard, first appearing in the Weird Weird Tales pulp magazines back in the day, uh, and then finally in comics in the 70s, uh, even earlier if you uh, count the Spanish comics that he was in. Uh, but to this day, an uh, uh, outstanding character, one that's still treated with respect, and whose latest adaptation at Titan Comics has been nothing short of extraordinary. But then... Within this, you had the inevitable introduction of a new character. Every company that has a characters in their universe, they're tasked with inevitably creating something new, something that they have to add to the mythos, something that pays homage and respect to what came before it without insulting the readers of that universe and without hurting the mythology of that universe by creating something that doesn't really necessarily quite fit in with the established mythos. So let's get into it. <clears throat> Sorry. Water here. Uh, so the first thing that they did with the creation of Brissa that I noticed as a reader, and I, obviously I don't know if this is the first thing they did, but that I noticed, the first thing I noticed that they did is uh, they took an established race that is in Robert E. Howard's mythology, which is the Picts. And they made her a pick. Now this is a race, and a and this is, you know, an amalgam of a bunch of different races, and how it created them, this race, and they were prominent in this fiction, from the Call stories to the Conan stories to the Brad Mac Morin stories to the James Allison stories, and even to the horror stories. Sometimes they're pictured as heroic, sometimes they're pictured as devolved, and sometimes they're just horrific and evil. Uh, the picks kind of encompass a little bit of everything for Robert E. Howard and the different ages that he puts them in and the characteristics of them change and that is played out beautifully in this. But you have in Cole's age, the Thurian age, you have Bull the Spear Slayer who becomes the right hand man to King Cull and who comes from his own tribe which is also ruled with intelligence, compassion, and uh, just with a good, strong ruler and someone that is from that race that stands beside a king and is trusted at all times to do the right thing. A very honored, very well-respected race in Cull's time. In Bran McMorton's time, him and the other picks, they're heroes. And some of the Robert E. Howard horror stories, they're evil uh, devolved creatures uh, that are just murderous and rampaging and you need to be careful and watch out for them because they'll kill you on sight. And that's often the case in Conan the Barbarian Tales, right? The Picts are a rival race to Conan and the Sumerians. Um, and tales like Beyond the Black River, stuff like that. They're, these are a race of people that represent evil that represent warfare and it's something that always has Conan and the other Sumerians on edge. If you run across a pick there's going to be more and you better be ready to fight fight for your life, fight to save those around you and hopefully make it out the other side alive. Now 
Brissa is a pick in Conan's age, but she's not like the other picks that we've seen previously in Conan's time period. Now, she is part of the uh, Thurian age. She's a descendant from there of Brule the Spear Slayer. Now, her race and her people, uh, her specific clan, have uh, somewhat been separated from the other picks. Is that they've they've uh, maintained their intelligence, uh, their compassion, their warrior spirit. Uh, they haven't devolved where the picks, the other picks in Conan's time period, have devolved, and there was a reason for that. And uh, of course, that's in Battle of the Black Stone, but we're not here to discuss that. So, what did they do right in the creation of Brissa? Uh, first, you created a character that fit into the larger mythos, right? Not only did this character fit in Conan's age, she fit in Cull's age, and I'm sure Bran Mac Morn's age. Uh, she's given a timeless kind of quality, which I won't delve into. I'll leave that for you to discover within the pages of Conan the Barbarian. Uh, but this is a character that is important to more than that age and to more than the Conan mythology. And so they've already established a character at once, just for the very race that she is. She's in contrast to Conan because Conan immediately is gonna view her as an enemy. So that's something that creates a conflict that they need to get over and squash and get to learn more about each other. To learn they have common goals all right so that was step number one right creating a character that fit into the larger mythos two you have to have great visual identifiers for the character right and because they're not just creating a character to put into the conan universe they're creating a character that's got to be instantly recognizable by her race by the way she looks that way new readers aren't confused by what race of people she belongs to, what clan she's a part of, and the older readers are happy with the creation of the character because they already know most of this stuff. So, uh, naming her Brissa and calling her a pick has a certain expectation that will come with a seasoned Robert E. Howard reader, especially of Conan's age uh, that takes place if, when you're putting a pick in that age period. So, Visual identifiers were important because it's also their task to bring in the new reader, to catch a new generation of Conian fans and draw them in and create a character that helps cement them into this universe and also pays enough respect to what's come before that us seasoned readers accept it, read it, love it, and embrace it, right? So job well done there. And with this one, they gave a blue strip of paint. Of course, her skin tone, uh, the flowing hair that she has, uh, she's instantly recognizable as a picked, but also set aside from her race in a way that lets you know there's something special about the character. And then when we get a flashback of Brule the Spear Slayer and he's got the same paint on, it instantly builds that connection in your mind before you're even recognized. You're like, ooh, okay. And uh, all the mytho mythology that comes after that makes sense. It all ties together. It's very tightly done. Uh, three, you need a character with common traits with the main character. And if not common traits, then completely opposing traits that the other character has to react to. But in this instance, she has common traits with him. That is a warrior's heart. Uh, that is a warrior's code of honor. And they connect on that. And they become friends and even lovers through their mutual respect for each other and the mutual trust that they build. Even though at first, him being a Sumerian and her being a pick automatically sets them as adversaries, uh, they're able to overcome that rather quickly when they both see the commonality of what kind of people they are. All right, and then four, we have a character that's not a clone of an existing character because it's very easy at least in my opinion, because I've read it in many comics and in many other stories, to just create a clone of a character you don't have the rights for. That is to say, Red Sonia, which they don't have the rights for. And you know there's got to be um, a female warrior character in a Conan universe. It just makes sense. It's just fun, and it just helps tell more stories. And it just gives you something else to play Conan against. But 
the lazy writers will just make a red Sonya clone. She's a warrior. Conan can't ever have her. She can't ever have Conan. And there always got to be this wall of tension between them. Now, with Brissa, she can't have Conan. Conan can have her. There's none of this um, falsely adapted uh, canonical stuff of a warrior's oath where she can't lay with another man and he can't be with her. Uh, so all that nonsense is gone. You just have this woman that's a warrior. She's her own person. She decides who she wants to be with, who she doesn't want to be with. She decides who she puts her sword arm in service to next to, not even in service to, just next to, who she decides to fight with and alongside or against. And her and Conan also fought. So she isn't beholden to anything that's come before in the Conan mythology, which is nice, uh, especially... Um, like a Red Sonja creation, which was in the comics more of a uh, Robert, um, not Robert, uh, Roy Thomas creation than anything else, right? Uh, the original Robert E. Howard Red Sonja is vastly different. Uh, but so you take Brissa, who's her own character, belongs to her own race that hasn't devolved, and and that gets explained along the way. So you know why she's different from the other picks of the era in Conan and the Barbarian. So really. Really good, really fascinating stuff. And then, not a clone, just her own character. She comes in, she feels fresh, she feels like she's already a part of the universe, and that she already belongs. At least that's my opinion on the matter. And then, we have a character, lastly, that enthralls the reader. Now, the only way that you're going to enthrall me, the reader, is if you have those first four characteristics in line, right? It's got to be a fresh character, it's got to be a character that is either directly opposed to Conan or shares the same traits with Conan. It's got to be a character that Conan respects, rather evil or good. Conan's got to have a respect for this character. And it's got to be a character that fits into the mythos. Uh, Brissa does all that brilliantly, plus tying her into the time periods of the Thurian Age along with the Hyborian Age and the ages in between and most likely the ages moving forward as we're seeing in Battle of the Black Stone. All right, with the uh, John Conrad and John Kirwan stories and, and um, with um, forgetting one of the characters already. But, uh, you know, uh, of course, the Brand MacMorran age and the El Borak age. There we go, El Borak. I was, I was blanking on it. Uh, Xavier Francis Gordon and, of course, James Allison Tales. So this character fits firmly into all of these mythologies without feeling out of place. Because the way that her history is built and the way that her character is developed makes sense for her to be a part of all of these ages in an important role. And then when you get her history, you see that her family has been tied to certain aspects that carry through all these ages uh, since their creation, right? Since her mother, uh, since since uh, Brule the Spear Slayer, and you see all the connective tissue. So not only do they create this very deep character, but they give the character connecting tissue through all the ages. They make her important. They give her a great visual design. They make her instantly recognizable. And they make her enthralling, interesting, a character you want to see fight side by side with Conan. A character has that has a comrade, camaraderie with Conan and are comrades in arms, right? Uh, Conan will pick up a sword and feel right at home fighting next to her on the battlefield, having her back and knowing she has his until one of them falls and then the other inevitably goes, right? But they're going to fight for each other's lives until the very end. And this is how you create a character that belongs in a universe, right? You make them important to the main character. You make them important to the universe. Uh, you give them traits that are both uh, complementary and in opposition to the main character because you want there to be some moral conflict between the two. And then, you know, through all these elements, you create a character that's so vastly interesting that you want to keep seeing them pop up. If you think they're dead and you actually feel concerned as a reader that you might not be able to read this character in future stories because you want to see their tales continue. But what do you guys think? That's just my opinion. To me, this was a textbook on how you create a character, how you make a character important to the mythos, how you make it important to the reader, and how you draw in new readers while pleasing the old readers. 
But again, that's one man's opinion. Let me know what you think in the comments below. And until next time, thank you for watching and keep it casual.